Hi, and welcome to the Scott Smith blog. This is Scott Smith. In this article, The Hidden Evil of the Starbucks Logo, we're going to go over all the following topics. Who is that strange mermaid lady on the Starbucks logo? What is the symbolic meaning of the image? Is the Starbucks logo Dagon? A Lovecraftian Philistine demon fish god? So, I like coffee a lot. Even so, I try to avoid Starbucks coffee like the plague. Though their coffee is admittedly delicious, even sinfully so, their affiliation with abortion providers is disgusting. With such insidious designs on life, marriage, the family, and religion, I started to wonder about that Starbucks logo. Also, after reading this article, if you're looking for alternatives to Starbucks coffee, I'll also include the link to an article I've written on Christian coffee companies and pro-life coffee companies. So, first up, Starbucks logo meaning. What is that creature? Most people realize that the name Starbucks comes from Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Starbuck was the name of the first mate of Captain Ahab's ship, the Pequod. Incidentally, Pequod was the first name chosen by the founders of Starbucks, Jerry Baldwin, Zev Siegel, and Gordon Bowker. But they eventually decided that name was a little too obscure. The character Starbuck was a Quaker and known for his goodness, all of which is ironic given the hidden meaning of the Starbucks logo. So what is that Starbucks logo? What is the symbolic meaning of the image? Is the Starbucks logo ISIS related? Is the Starbucks logo Dagon? A Lovecraftian Philistine demon fish god? Or is this all just a big conspiracy theory? Find out in this video. So where did the original Starbucks logo come from? How did it evolve from the original image to the current version? Here is the official history of the Starbucks logo according to the FAQ on the Starbucks webpage. When we were originally looking for a logo for Starbucks in 1971, we wanted to capture the seafaring tradition of early coffee traders. We pored over old marine books until we came up with a logo based on an old 16th century Norse woodcut, a two-tailed mermaid encircled by the store's original name, Starbucks Coffee, Tea, and Spice. Co-founder Howard Schultz elaborates a bit more on the story in this excerpt from his 1997 book, Pour Your Heart Into It, How Starbucks Built a Company One Cup at a Time. Quote, Another Starbucks co-founder, Terry Heckler, also poured over old marine books until he came up with a logo based on an old 16th century Norse woodcut, a two-tailed mermaid or siren encircled by the store's original name, Starbucks Coffee, Tea, and Spice. That early siren, bare-breasted and rubenesque, was supposed to be as seductive as coffee itself." End quote. There's a problem with this. There's no such thing as a 16th century Norse woodcut. The Norse ceased to exist as such around 1300 AD. Woodcuts didn't arrive in Europe until about 1400 AD. Finding a 16th century Norse woodcut would be like finding a photograph of Leonardo da Vinci or a selfie of Abraham Lincoln. It just didn't happen. So what's the real story? Where did this image come from and what is that weird mermaid thing? Let's just assume the founders of Starbucks meant nothing insidious by this anachronism. It is most likely they just forgot where they found the image. That's a bit odd given their ferocious protection of their own intellectual property, but whatever. So where did the Starbucks logo really come from? It seems Michael Kravosky of Dead Programmers Cafe was among the first to unravel the mystery. In How the Starbucks Siren Became Less Naughty, Kravosky reveals that the original Starbucks logo, pictured here, bears an uncanny resemblance to an entry in J. E. Serlo's Dictionary of Symbols, which was first published in English in 1962. 
There's something just not right about this crowned mermaid and the way she is holding her double fishtail. Not to put too fine a point on it, but the bare-chested mermaid appears pretty sexually provocative. The Starbucks logo evolved from here through various stages of simplification and abstraction. The evolution of the Starbucks logo. Starbucks seems to have agreed that their original logo wasn't exactly G-rated, especially as they went corporate. Here's the transition of Starbucks logos since the 1970s. Thankfully, Starbucks allowed their masthead a modicum of modesty. The mermaid covers up a bit so she's no longer bare-chested. Good decision! Also, Starbucks refocused the logo on the mermaid's face and, thank God, away from whatever she was doing with those fishtails. But that still leaves a big question. Who is the Starbucks mermaid and why is she wearing a crown? According to Symbol Dictionary, the twin-tailed mermaid is Melusine or Melisande, a siren of Angapede, Angaped body type, who is also a symbol in alchemy. The legend of Melusine runs deep in French history, even to the days of Charlemagne. Several royal houses trace their lineage from Melusine's family, including houses of Plantagenet, Angevin, and Anjou. Many rulers of French descent through history, including Richard I, the Lionheart, have claimed to be descended from the devil. As cited by the historian Fleury, the chronicler Giraud Le Cambrien reports that King Richard was fond of telling a tale that he was a descendant of a Countess of Anjou who was in fact the fairy Melusine, concluding that his whole family, quote, came from the devil and would return to the devil, end quote. The Duke of Berry commissioned Jean d'Arras in 1393 to write an account of the story of Melusine, the Chronique de Melusine. According to The Serpent and the Swan, the animal bride in folklore and literature, d'Arras abbreviated Mère de Lusignan, or Mother of the Lusignan, to form the name Melusine. Well, that's great. We have a name for this weird mermaid lady. But what is this legend of Melusine, the lady of Starbucks? Melusine was the daughter of Priscina, a water fairy, and a mortal man, King Elenus, or King Helmus. Melusine wasn't born a mermaid, however. This was an affliction created by Melusine's mother as punishment for what Melusine did to her father. King Elinas met Priscina at the Fontaine de la Soif. Fontaine de la Soif the fountain of thirst, maybe the thirst for coffee, and fell instantly in love. Pressina agreed to marry the king with one condition. He must never enter into her chambers during or just after childbirth. Shortly thereafter, Pressina gave birth to three daughters, Melusine, Melior, and Plantina. As to be expected, King Elenas soon broke his promise to Pressina. His curiosity soon got the best of him. Overcome with grief, Priscina runs away with her babies to a hidden island, Cephalonia. One day, many years later, Priscina takes her girls to look upon their father's kingdom. It is then that she tells them of their father's broken promise. Melusine decides to seek revenge against her father. With the help of her sisters, she kidnaps her father and imprisons him inside a mountain. Priscina becomes enraged when she discovers her daughter's treachery, so she curses her daughter. Every Sabbath day thereafter, Melusine's lower half transforms into a fish or serpent. Time passes. Melusine grows to womanhood, living alone in the forest. So, just a weird Starbucks lady living alone in the forest, drinking coffee. So what? Into Melusine's forest comes Raymondin who is either the Count of Anjou or the Duke of Aquitaine, depending on the account. He is distressed after having accidentally killed his uncle during a boar hunt. Melusine counsels him on how to explain the accidental death of his uncle. She also promises him wealth and power, as though she were a genie granting wishes. Ramondin quickly proposes marriage to the strange forest lady. Wealth, power, accidental killings, what's not to like, right? Definitely marriage material, but wait, there's more. Like her mother, 
Melusine accepts the marriage proposal conditionally. Raimondin is prohibited from seeing her in her chambers on the Sabbath. Stays in her room all day on Sundays? This lady's just ticking through the commandments. Giving little thought to the request, they were married at once. Melusine did as she promised. Raimondin's kingdom grew quickly in power and stature. They built the cities of Poitou and Lusignan, where Melusine became the mother of the Lusignan line. She built a castle in Lusignan, where she became known as a gracious ruler. After years of marriage and ten mostly deformed children, Ramondin began to grow weary of his promise. Curiously, Melisande was also loath to attend Mass at their cathedral. Finally, in a fit of jealousy, Ramondin peeks into Melisande's chamber and sees her bathing. So, the Starbucks Melisande? She's just as beautiful as ever from the waist up, but dot dot dot. From the waist down, her fishtails or serpent tails or whatever are thrashing around in the water. Gross. Ramondin never told anybody about what he had seen, until he did. Ramondin tried to convince himself that nothing was wrong. So what if she's half serpent? She's a great mother, right? And she's beautiful. Most of the time, anyway. But then their kids started doing bad things. Like when little Joffrey burnt down some churches. Ramondin finally accused his wife of being a fausse serpent, a false serpent. Melusine didn't take this too well. It wasn't so much that her husband accused her of being the spawn of Satan. She was distraught that he had broken his promise. So Melusine does what any of us would do in a situation like that. Melusine turned into a dragon creature and flew away. For the next several generations, she was said to visit her children in the night in human form. Mostly, though, when she would appear, it was just a bad omen. If you saw her flying around, crying like a banshee, it meant death would visit the land that night. Awesome! Let's go start a coffee company in her image. So, what then does the Starbucks Dragon Lady logo mean? Here's an interesting example of Starbucks product placement in an 8th century cathedral. The she-dragon creature has made multiple appearances in iconography as well as history. The oldest known image of Melusine, the twin-tailed mermaid, is on the mosaic floor of the Otranto Cathedral. One section of the floor depicts images of Eden, along with the tree of life growing from the back of two elephants. Another section depicts the inferno, virtues to adopt and vices to avoid. This is where we find Melison. Otranto, the home of this cathedral, passed hands through several of history's empires, including the Greek, Roman, Byzantine, and Norman. Commissioned by the city's Norman rulers, the cathedral was eventually completed by the local Greek-Italian monks. If that wasn't already a mix of symbols and icons, Otranto was also home to a thriving Jewish community. Some hypothesize that Kabbalah, a form of Jewish mysticism, is the key to understanding the unusual mosaic. Hmm, Eden, Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, and an evil serpent lady? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Lilith. The Starbucks Dragon Lady is none other than Lilith. I've previously written about Lilith in this other article, link provided below, and the appropriation of her name and likeness by radical feminists and pro-abortion groups such as the Lilith Fund, which raised money for so-called emergency abortions in the wake of Hurricane Harvey in 2017. Lilith has been called, quote, the goddess of a thousand faces, end quote, but she's no goddess. Sometimes described as Adam's first wife among her many promoters, she is typically described in literature as the devil's own wife and a child eater. Lilith is actually an entire category of demons. The Lilith is a sexually wanton demon that comes in the night and steals newborn babies. So she's the perfect patroness of an abortion fund. There are ancient Sumerian prayers for women and newborns that call for protection from the Lilith. She even appears in scripture, which you can read more about in my other article. In his book, The White Goddess, the poet Robert Graves described Lilith. Quote, 
The goddess is a lovely, slender woman with a hooked nose, deathly pale face, lips as rowan berries, startlingly blue eyes, and long, fair hair. She will suddenly transform herself into sow, mare, bitch, vixen, she-ass, weasel, serpent, owl, she-wolf, tigress, mermaid, or loathsome hag. Her names and titles are innumerable. In ghost stories, she often figures as the White Lady, and in ancient religions, from the British Isles to the Caucasus, as the White Goddess. I cannot think of any true poet from Homer onwards who has not independently recorded his experience of her. The test of a poet's vision, one might say, is the accuracy of his portrayal of the White Goddess, and of the island over which she rules. The reason why the hair stands on end, the eyes water, the throat is constricted, the skin crawls, and a shiver runs down the spine when one writes or reads a true poem is that a true poem is necessarily an invocation of the white goddess, or muse, the mother of all living, the ancient power of fright and lust, the female spider or the queen bee whose embrace is coffee. Just kidding. Death. End quote. As described above, Lilith frequently occurs among the archetypes of the world's cultures. She is the Siren, the Lady in White, Duessa and the Fairy Queen, even Ursula in Disney's The Little Mermaid, and of course, Dragon Lady Melisande. She dates as far back as 2000 BC, and her image is found in ancient Sumerian tablets. Insert shivers here. Lilith is usually depicted as a beautiful woman from the waist up, and as serpentine from the waist down. Sound familiar? Okay. One last theory, even though I'm pretty sure we figured out the conclusion to this article, is the Starbucks logo not an evil mermaid, but actually Dagon, the evil fish god of the Philistines. Dagon was a fish god worshipped by the Philistines. The Starbucks logo is clearly some sort of fish creature, so is it Dagon? Here's a Starbucks meme you might encounter floating around the internet describing the Starbucks logo as derivative of the Dagon fish god. The implicit argument here is that the golden idol on the left is Dagon, but is it? First off, probably not. The Starbucks logo is a crowned female with twin tails. These don't match Dagon, which is typically presented as male with a single tail. Let's still examine the evidence, though. Here are some common depictions of Dagon, or at least these are depictions of the Babylonian Oans, mentioned by Barossus in the 3rd century BC. Oans only became associated with Dagon in the 19th and 20th centuries. The scholarship making this connection has come under some scrutiny, withering scrutiny. Iconographically, we are not really sure what Dagon looked like. The golden idol meme above is likely just a false equivalence. But hey, while we're here, the pagan god Dagon is described in the Bible. First, Samson tearing down the temple of Dagon. Judges 16.23 describes how the temple to Dagon in Gaza is destroyed by Samson. Samson was chained to the temple supporting columns. Samson knocked these down and destroyed the pagan temple as his last act after regaining his strength. Here is a temple of Dagon set from the movie version of Samson and Delilah. Hollywood is also apparently not of the opinion that Dagon was a fish god, or at least the fish god is equipped with two very non-fishy feet. Here's an interesting story about the Ark of the Covenant knocking Dagon down. 1 Samuel 5 describes how the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines and taken to Dagon's temple in Ashdod. The following morning, the Ashdodites discovered the image of Dagon had fallen and was laying prostrate before the Ark. They restored the image to its original position, but the following morning they again found Dagon prostrate before the Ark. This time, however, its head and hands had been severed. Take that, Dagon. It's a bad idea to place a false idol near the Ark of the Covenant. Just ask the Nazis. All right. Conclusion. Is the Starbucks logo Dagon the fish god? No. 
The crowned female with the devil fishtails is likely not Dagon, the male pagan god of the Philistines. It's uncertain whether Dagon is even part fish at all, or if that's the separate Babylonian and Phoenician god, Oans. Regardless, even if Dagon is half fish, the other half is a man, not a woman. There is far more evidence supporting the Melusine theory of the Starbucks logo. Either way you cut it though, the symbolism of the Starbucks logo is evil. Thanks for listening, and make sure to comment below with any interesting responses you might have, or interesting new theories. And I'll leave you with this thought. Do we now finally understand Austin Powers and Dr. Evil's corporate acquisition of Starbucks? You can check out all the links I provided below. I've included my articles with lists of pro-life Christian alternatives to Starbucks, as well as a more thorough examination of Lilith. Thanks for listening. This has been Scott Smith with the Scott Smith Blog. Enjoy your coffee.